no person has been more requested to be a guest for the show than Andreas Antonopoulos, an incredible thinker with a passion for blockchain technology. Andreas has become one of the most trusted names in the industry. And today we are excited to welcome Andreas to the show to answer a bunch of questions, both from us and from you, the listeners of the show. It's a jam packed conversation. You aren't going to want to miss a beat. In fact, you may want to listen to it twice and pass it on to a friend who doesn't quite yet get blockchain. Saddle up, buckaroos. Andreas Antonopoulos is in the house for episode number 244 of the Bad Crypto Podcast. Five, four, three, two, one, two, ignition. Who's bad? And this is an exciting day in the Republic of Bad Cryptopia because we are checking off another bucket list interview, Mr. Travis Wright. Yeah, that is true. We've we've reached out to Mr. Andreas a few times over the past 18 months to try to get him on the show, and he's got one hell of a gatekeeper over there. I think it's his wife, and she didn't like she didn't like anything bad, and so she didn't want to have have him be part of anything bad. So bad crypto is bad, and. Uh, but we finally got through, and uh, he came on the show. And then a couple of days after we interviewed him, we got to meet him in person in Denver, which was amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that show, the ETH Denver live show, is coming up here in just a few episodes as well. Mm-hmm. So we'll get to the interview in just a moment. want to give shout-outs to our show sponsors, CoinPayments.net. You've heard us talk about them before. We're going to talk about them again now because they are the first to support stable coin payment processing. So if you are taking, you want to take crypto payments on your website, you can join the thousands of merchants who do, and now you can accept stable coins of among the litany of other coins that are accepted. So this helps to avoid volatility. That way, you know, when you take a payment in crypto, you don't have to worry, oh, is Bitcoin going to drop, you know, 10% today? Of course, it could go up 10% as well. So you can stay in the crypto realm. You don't have to deal with the banks and US dollar pegged stable coins supported for payments and wallets include all of these stable coins. Tether, the USD coin, the Gemini dollar, the true USD, it's all at coinpayments.net. Let's show our uh, love for crypto and adopt it in our businesses. Go check them out today. And I, and I want to give Mr. Joel Com bonus points for the use of the word litany. Mm, that was nice. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Travis. We have a litany of sponsors today. Actually, we only have two. Uh, <laughs> we want to talk yeah, about two's, two's not a litany. Two's two not a litany. How many, how many a is a fit? What's a litany? How many? How many is that? Like five uh, uh, more more than a five more than a few okay yeah. just, just trying to you know trying to get my my head wrapped around that all right digitex futures uh, is a, are also our sponsor of this episode they are launching a commission-free trading platform for btc eth and litecoin future contracts which is really interesting and their trading platform will eliminate all transaction fees as well as withdrawal and deposit fees it's really is a game changer, and basically their token is is what sort of helps out with the transaction fees and the withdrawal and all that other good stuff. But uh, really sweet, they have over a million people in line right now uh, to get inside their beta, and I believe they are going to have a Q two launch coming up. So who knows how many they'll have when it's all said and done. But uh, if you go to badco.in forward slash future, you can uh, get your name in the queue. And um, it's pretty interesting. They The exchange is going to operate on its own base cryptocurrency, the DGTX token. And as more traders are attracted to the zero fee revenue model, the more demand is created for the token, which in effect will allow for the token price to steadily grow in value in theory. So that's great. Uh, looking forward for that, Mr. Joel Com. Excellent. Thanks, Coin Payments and Digitex, for your support of this program. And thanks to you, our listeners, for supporting our sponsors. At least go check out what they're doing because they help make this show possible. Okay. Andreas Antonopoulos is in the house. And without another breath from me, <gasps> here's the interview. Okay. One more breath. We're super excited today because the most oft-requested guest 
to be appearing on Bad Crypto has finally agreed to be here. I'm not exactly sure if he knows what he's gotten himself into, but he's here. He could always cut and run if he wants to, but I hope he doesn't because he is the one, the only Andreas M. Antonopoulos. Andreas, welcome to Bad Crypto. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joel. It's a pleasure to be on the show. You um, you are kind of known as the voice of Bitcoin to a lot of people. And just to give a quick background, you wrote a book in 2014 called Mastering Bitcoin. You wrote a book in 2016 called The Internet of Money. You wrote a book in 2018 called Mastering Ethereum. And you are an in-demand guy that you get interviewed on BBC, Bloomberg, CNN, Forbes, Vice, all over the place. And I just want to know how does it feel to be like this this guy who's this meek individual you seem like a real humble guy and yet you are asked to speak all over the place well it's ironic actually is the early uh, days of crypto i was being asked to go on the, many of the places you just mentioned they don't ask me anymore i think what's happened after 2016 2017 uh with um the ico craze was we got a, a completely different set of spokespeople for crypto now. Well-funded, polished marketing, glitzy graphics, um, spokespeople who are talking all about their uh, fantastic ICOs. And the the TV networks and all of the mainstream are picking them up. So, you know, w when I respond to requests for interviews and I say, I'm only interested in talking about technology, I won't talk about ICOs, I won't make price predictions, and I won't badmouth other people in the industry, the journalists go, oh, well, <laughs> not interested. They're like, please badmouth some people. We need our ratings. But it doesn't, it doesn't, yeah. I mean, <laughs> so I used to, I used to go on these shows, they'd invite me and they, they, they try to bait me into saying outrageous things. Like, it was really funny in 2017. I got called by all of these journalists and they said, uh, do you think Bitcoin is in a bubble? And they were hoping I would say no, so they could put their economist guy up there to say, oh, yes, it is in a bubble. And then we could do the talking heads. And I would say, well, yeah, of course it is. That was what was amazing to me. You called it. I, I watched your, um, your video, Blockchain Versus Bullshit. It was a presentation that you did, the thoughts on the future of money, which I thought was excellent. Anybody who is listening to this, you should go check that out on, on YouTube. But you literally predicted, you said, yes, we're going to have a rise and then it's going to come down. And like this, exactly what's happened over the last two years, essentially, you pretty much predicted that. How, how did you know that we were going to see like this nice rise and then just this utter crash? Because I've seen it four times before because I've been here long enough. Right. That's, that was a huge that was a huge run we had. Like twenty grand. Like what? Like, yeah, it's it's been wild but, watching, especially for some of us newbies. Uh, you also said the this. The thing is, you, you gotta you gotta see from the perspective, each one of these is feels exactly the same. So mm. as much as this was crazy, the run to one dollar mm. was probably the most um the most exciting run. Dollar parity, the day that Bitcoin hit one dollar when nobody thought that that would happen, right? The first recorded sale we have on an exchange for Bitcoin was um, a thousand Bitcoin for a dollar, right? Mm. Um, and to then rise 1,000 times in price and be a dollar each was a huge accomplishment. When it went to 30, oh my God, everyone was so giddy. And then of course it crashed to 75 cents and everybody started writing articles about how it's dead now. So the, the funny thing is, in retrospect, this one was huge. But no, if you zoom out, it wasn't even the biggest one. Right, per percentage-wise, per right? Because from $30 to $0.75 cents is a much bigger fall than 20000 to 3500 yeah, and when it's when it's done it five times, by the fifth time you're like, eh, okay, here we go again. But <laughs> the, trust me, the first couple th that was more exciting than twenty thousand. The rise up to thirty was more exciting than twenty thousand because it, it was breaking into amounts that nobody ever expected. Right? Once it's done that, then you're like, oh, okay, this really has a future. But at that point, we. You know, nobody was sure that this thing had a future, 
right? But but there's still people that aren't sure it has a future, right? There are some that are predicting that Bitcoin's going to go to zero. That are others that are saying, well, mm-hmm. we forked Bitcoin and it's going to be this new, you know, fork of Bitcoins that's going to be successful. So why are you a, a Bitcoin core purist? I'm not, and I think that's that's a key misunderstanding. Um, I'm not. I'm not a maximalist. And I'm not a purist in any sense of the way of the word. I think that today Bitcoin is positioned as the strongest, most resilient, most robust, most secure system of cryptocurrency that exists, and it has a tremendous chance of continuing just doing what it does with its resilience for a very long time. I think it's actually quite unlikely that uh, Bitcoin can crash back down to zero. And part of the reason for that is because it would take messing up the protocol in a way that would make uh, some of the early adopters abandon it. Like, for example, uh, people ask me often, why would you leave Bitcoin? And I can give you some very specific reasons. If we see a protocol level KYC AML introduce, introduced at the protocol level, right? And the only the only Bitcoin you can buy on exchanges and things like that, and all of the exchanges participate in this, and you end up with Bitcoin being identity driven, right? So that you have to attach an identity, um, then it's not Bitcoin. To me, that's that's done. So I walk away from that. And then I, I look at what else can give me the same properties without any of that silliness. Right. So if you if you stop making it decentralized, if you stop making it permissionless, if it stops being borderless, if it stops being neutral, if it stops being censor persistent, then it stops being interesting. And at that point, I walk. There's nothing sacred about any of this. It's just a technology. It's not a religion. It doesn't work. We re-implement it. We redesign it. We build another one. We try again with a different set of characteristics that will be more resilient to, to attacks. The first church of Bitcoin. Woo! No, I want to I want to ask this because in 2017, in that same uh, keynote, you said that Bitcoin today, compared to the internet, we we were at 1992. That's where we were. So I'm curious. You know, a year and a half later. Where are we now? Because we just, we, you know, some people are saying, oh, we just had the big crash. It's the year 2000 now. But I'm, I'm curious, where do you think we are? No, we're not. Nowhere near. Uh, I, I would say we're, <laughs> we're in the middle of 1994, um, year and a half later. Mm. Um, no, we're, we're still at the early infrastructure stage. We're, we're still at the um, dial-up stage. Very much so. That's that's really interesting because the I was there when the first internet boom happened and and got started building sites in 1995 and wrote it up and then remember when you know it hit the bust and it was the media hype that drove so much of the interest and and I see a corollary I can't talk but that's okay I see a, you know something similar there with what happened is on the Bitcoin run to twenty thousand everybody was talking about it. Um, so, you know, what does the the next run look like then? Is it going to be this hype cycle again, or is it going to be because of real world applications that are going to be the buzz? I have no idea. I mean, it could be one or the other. I'm, you know, if, if, if the reason everybody is talking about it is because of what it did recently in its price, which is what happened during this last run-up, the reason people were talking about it was not because of what the technology could achieve or because of any of its applications or because of any of its use cases other than pure speculation. And that speculation was not based on future capabilities or features or, or technological developments. It was based purely on the price and what the price had done. So the price was reflexive of itself. The price goes up because the price went up. If you have that kind of a a boom cycle, then at some point, the the price exceeds any level um, that is stable based on its foundational components, and it reverses. And as soon as it reverses, that price reflexivity turns into a downward spiral. So you get these massive booms followed by massive busts. And 
you know, honestly, all that does is it creates another group of X million people who go, oh, well, yeah, I got involved in that. And then I, I get people ask me now, they say, you know, didn't, didn't the CEO of Bitcoin uh, die recently and, um, <laughs> and uh, didn't have a, a will, so all of his keys are lost? You know, it's, again, people don't really understand what this is. And what's interesting is every time we do one of these boom and bust cycles, some people stay. So all of the sharks that were feeding off of this phenomenon, all of the shills and opportunists and uh, snake oil salespeople, they go away. They're no longer interested. And that's great. Good riddance. We're back to basics and we can focus on some real stuff. But the interesting thing is some people stay. They got in for the price. They got really, really excited. But along that journey... They're like, okay, so now I've bought some, what can I do with it? And they start doing a bit of research and then they hear about something else or they hear about lightning or they hear about uh, smart contracts or they hear about something else. And suddenly they, they start getting interested in technology and start reading. Hopefully they stumble across some of my videos and then they stay for the tech. So come for the price, stay for the tech and they're going to be around for the next round. You know, you, you've said you've said a lot. I mean, I've watched a lot of your videos, and you're you're just brilliant. I love how you you just go on. It's like sometimes you don't even have slides. And you're just going on and just telling the I story. I never it's have great. slides. Yeah. yeah, it's great, great watching you. So you mentioned in one, you said that allocation of trust is one of the things that is really exciting for you, and I'd love for you maybe to expand on that for our audience because it seems like that's one thing that's missing within our current economic system and our monetary system is. We don't know how many dollars there are in the Federal Reserve Bank. We don't know how many yuan there are or, or rubles or any of that. It's just they, they print them out and they tell us to spend them and here you go. But but Bitcoin actually changes all of that. So if you can maybe talk about allocation of trust, I, I, that'd be great. Well, I think that's one of the most important things to understand about this technology. And I'm not talking just about Bitcoin. I'm talking about the broader space of open, decentralized public uh, cryptocurrencies that use some kind of consensus algorithm to decentralize trust. All of those systems have one thing in common. Currency is just the application. It's one of the applications. And it, it's in, in Bitcoin, it's essential to its nature, its monetary policy, as well as its security mechanism. But it's not the only application you can do. And the really interesting thing about this technology is that it, it creates a new model for trust. Our existing... Um, uh, institutions in society are institutions that provide trust through the application of policies, procedures, hierarchies, committees, uh, human organizations, effectively. So you have layers of oversight, you have layers of decision making, you have standard operating policies, you have things like constitutions and articles of organization that define what is acceptable behavior within a, within a hierarchy, and then enforce that. And what we trust is that the institution is running these rules in a way that generates trust, right? And a lot of that has to do with reputation and oversight, but also with enforcement and sometimes uh, punitive measures, right? If people violate trust or if they have some kind of duty, like a fiduciary duty, mm -hmm. and they violate that, they end up in jail. Uh, in a system that's working, where the institutions are working and they're generating trust, that's what happens. So what happens when those institutions don't scale is we start losing trust in them. Right now, if you look at polls that are done in Western developed nations, um, people have very, very low trust in all of the main institutions that came out of the industrialization era. So um, representative governments, uh, media, newspapers, the church, you know, all of the modern institutions we have and some of the ancient institutions we have, have lost the confidence of people. And they've lost the confidence of people because they failed to deliver on their promises. And the reason they failed is because they can't scale their decision making. So all of what blockchain technologies do, what they do with this element of decentralization is they give us a new model for trust. And this model is there are certain rules in the software. Those cannot be changed without a very, very large supermajority. Um, and it's a participatory voluntary system. But if you, if you voluntarily participate in this, you trust that the system will execute according to its rules, 
without the ability for human intervention. That's basically it. And once you have that, once you can trust in the system instead of in trusting the other party you're transacting with or someone to do oversight or some committee to properly enforce the rules, that's a different model. It's a model we haven't had before. Um, and that model of decentralized trust, uh, obviously currency is a very good application for it, but it's not the only application. And gradually we can start building more and more interesting applications on top. Well, you know, on a macro level, that makes a lot of sense. It trust, you know, in the financial institutions versus, you know, the code that that Bitcoin and blockchain are built on. But then we have issues where, you know, Roger Ver and his group, they fork off to Bitcoin Cash. And then, you know, Craig Wright, who uh, does not speak fondly of you for whatever reason, um, forks off and they've got Satoshi's vision. And there's branding issues like Bitcoin.com is actually not core how how do we in blockchain build trust when there's so much conflict within this family oh that's very very simple the trust mechanism hasn't changed at all which is that you choose which chain to trust based on what software you run and what rules that executes and if you have chosen to run a certain software base that enforces a certain set of consensus rules all of this other stuff is noise. Uh, marketing, branding, does not matter. Marketing and branding, what you call the thing does not change the consensus rules, right? When I'm running a client and choosing a specific set of consensus rules, to that client, all of this is invisible noise. It never happens. It doesn't matter who controls which domains. It doesn't matter who controls which brands. It doesn't matter what you call it. It, it doesn't matter how much authority you claim based on the writings of one person or another uh, or association with different people because none of that matters. That's the old model of trust, this model of appeal to authority, which in fact, the whole point of what Satoshi was doing, and it's very clear in all of his writings and his references to cypherpunk ideology, was to take the idea of appeal to authority and stab it repeatedly until it's totally dead. And one of the main ways that Satoshi did that was to disappear and leave the scene so as to remove any possibility of appeal. To so, so does that mean you don't so, believe that Craig Wright is part of the initial Satoshi team? Does it matter? It doesn't. That's the whole point. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter one bit. It doesn't change anything about the consensus rules it doesn't change. And, and in my opinion, doesn't matter either. It doesn't matter if I believe it or not. It doesn't matter if you believe it or not. This isn't a system based on belief. This is a system based on consensus rules. And so the question is not who is or isn't Satoshi or any of that, or which vision is true or not. The only question that matters is which software are you running and what rules does it follow? And that's a very different way of building trust in systems than we've had before. And, and people misunderstand that. And what they're looking for is some form of leadership, someone to tell them, what should I trust? Well, that's the old way of doing things. You don't ask someone who appears to have authority or reputation or popularity to tell you who to trust. You decide to run the software that you think expresses the ideals you care about. And that's it. And you don't have to choose just one. You can run more than one of them. We can explore all possible avenues in the in all of the various design trade-offs. You want big blocks, you want small blocks, you want medium warm blocks, you want uh, long blocks with extra fudge. Just run all of them. It doesn't. It doesn't. You I can want have the it fudge, all, right? Fudge. So, yeah, ex exactly. So you can fork the software. You can call it Bitcoin Fudge, and you can have your fudge own fudge. rules. It, it again. Yes, exactly. Now, the question is, Is are you going to deliver something that is of interest to a large enough uh, population of users who are going to put their economic activity on that chain and make it uh, do something interesting? Um, are you going to be able to compete for the attention, interest, and resources of users? And some, some systems succeed and some systems don't. And it's a pure evolutionary adaptive environment, right? So 
the software that survives is the software that most people are interested in using because they agree with the principles it expresses. The rest is all soap opera, really. And, you know, to me, none of it matters. None of that matters. And I, I don't begrudge other people for trying to do things differently. I want to ask you about this. I want to follow up on that trust line because, you know, you know every since it seems to me that since the, the, the 2016 election, there's been a, a trust is just a, a nebulous thing for people, right? There's a, there's a trust problem with media. What do we know if they're telling us the truth? And now there's becoming more and more so a problem with trust in social media with these big tech companies, you know, blocking people and censoring them and eliminating them from the platform. How can blockchain solve that? Is this something that blockchain could do to to maybe help help fix this problem with trust in our society today? Not yet. Sometime in the future, possibly. I think the way we one of the ways we fix it is by um, changing the way we run economic systems, right? So changing the way we run financial services, because one of the problems we have. I think especially in Western developed countries, is that the, the, the modern mechanisms of, of capitalism have, have evolved into these monstrosities, right? We've got surveillance capitalism on one side, which monetizes your private information. Mm -hmm. um, we've got the um, empty financialization of, of Wall Street, where it's not about building a product, it's about building an investable startup. It's not about building a company, it's about building a, um, a debt financialization machine that can leverage low interest rates to create uh, a tsunami of debt that can overwhelm competition, achieve monopoly status, and once it's achieved monopoly status, extract rents. That's the model we have today. And that model is is because the system is broken right there money is broken markets mm -hmm. are broken and we've we've gotten into this very weird situation uh, you know in essence the the very large multinational corporations the that we have in western developed economies are not capitalist organizations they're they're social welfare organizations they basically buy politicians who give them special handouts and uh, almost free money in order to create monopolies. They have the collaboration of the state in creating monopolies. They have socialized the means of production. <laughs> and effectively, they're terrified of free mm. markets, right? Free markets is how you lose, um, you lose uh, shareholder value uh, because then you have competition. So they tried to ban mm. any form of competition. Well, you know, as you as you talk about that, I'm, we have a bunch of questions that were submitted to listeners of the show, and I want to make sure we get some of those in here. And this, uh, the whole brokenness of money brings up this question from Paulo. He says, does the Greek default in bailout frame your focus of the world? And do you see a euro crisis or the U.S. debt mess up is the trigger for crypto adoption? Or is it going to be something less uh, significant, like Samsung adding crypto wallets to their phones by default? What do you think is going to trigger the adoption? So I don't think uh, adoption is something that is triggered by one cataclysmic event or um, one uh, worldwide crisis. Certainly don't want that to be the case. I think there's this uh, gleeful attitude towards apocalyptic scenarios, which is very unbecoming and really shows a degree of greed. When people say, oh, the US dollar is going to crash and destroy itself, and euro is going to crash and destroy itself, and then I'm going to be rich with my Bitcoin. You know, what, what you're saying there is, I don't give a shit if 350 million people almost starve to death or go through a horrible depression as long as I'm all right. You know, that's, that's not a good attitude to have. And it, it's a huge turnoff for people who are interested in crypto to hear that to hear the idea that only in a doomsday scenario does this system succeed. Fiat destroys itself because fiat destroys itself consistently and historically. And because you create massive imbalances in fiat, eventually it's, those imbalances are going to cause problems in, in the real economy. But you know, crypto is going to be adopted in bits and pieces with different applications in different countries and different cultures and populations for different reasons. 
right now it's being adopted in South America because they have stupid bad currency. In places like Russia and China, crypto is going to be adopted by dissidents who are working in a surveillance environment that is, uh, you know, totalitarian in its nature, and where it's impossible for them to to act in the democratic institutions without the ability to fundraise outside of the system. Um, so you're going to have a, dissidents use it. In other places, it's going to be refugees using it. In other places, it's going to be immigrants sending money home for remittances. And maybe we'll see some more mainstream applications. Uh, I think one of the very promising ones, for example, is gaming. So uh, some obscure games that has some in-game component that that is a tradable cryptocurrency eventually is going to be uh, somewhat successful and is going to create a lot of interest in the platform, right? So all of these things happen at different times in different places to different degrees. It's not going to be a one day we wake up and suddenly everybody wants to do crypto. We're not ready for that. And it's going to take waves of adoption, followed by waves of building better infrastructure and creating better applications, followed by other waves of adoptions now that new applications are possible. Yeah, I'm with you. There's, there's, we've had a lot of conversations on bad crypto with different, you know, people who are building different blockchains. And what we've started to see now is like this, this adoption of, of D apps and games that are starting to pop up. Like we, we actually uh, had a, had a gentleman on the show not long ago, Kurt uh, Braggett, and he was talking about uh, dapradar.com. And you can see all these different games that are being populated on EOS and on Tron and Ethereum, you got to get to like number 45 or so for the first Ethereum dApp to pop up on that. And all these other ones are games. They're doing gambling stuff and different in, in, in app, you know, games where they're earning cryptos and, and whatnot. So I, I guess I want to ask you then about, you know, what do you think about dApps and the future of those and smart contracts and, and how they relate to, you know, the, the development of this ecosystem as a whole? Well, I, I obviously think the that space is very interesting because I wrote my fourth book on, on that topic with uh, Mastering Ethereum. I got a lot of flack from Bitcoiners about that because um, somehow some people think that that means I'm no longer interested in Bitcoin as if that would ever be the case. You know, I think there these are very complementary systems. I don't see most of the cryptos I don't see um very effectively competing against each other. Over the last two years, we've put this enormous emphasis, which is primarily expressed by these websites that show a ranking of cryptocurrencies by market capitalization, which is a stupid metric, by the way, it's completely meaningless. And and they're doing this leaderboard, which has allowed all of the journalists in the space, and I, I use journalists in the loosest way possible, um, to to then go to their comfort zone. And their comfort zone is the horse race, right? This is how politics is covered around the world. This is how sports is covered. And that sports-like metaphor uh, of a horse race, where it's like, and in second position, rising fast <laughs> is Tron. You know, will it challenge the leadership of blah blah? blah. <laughs> right. And it's not a, it's not about any of the principles or technologies or fundamentals or whether people actually need this. Shit. It's simply about who's winning now. One thing that has done is it's distracted us tremendously from the fact that these systems are not operating in a vacuum. They're operating in the real world where what we're competing against is people who are unbanked, desperate, in poverty, and are not being served by the current financial system. Right? That's not shown anywhere in the market cap. You don't see how many people are now able to do remittances who weren't before, are able to escape with some currency as refugees who weren't able to do that before. You know, that's what's interesting to me. So when I look at the crypto system, the ecosystem as a whole, I don't see cryptos really as competing against each other. I or especially not this zero sum idea that they're competing for some fixed sized pie and then we need to look at the market dominance of one versus the other. That's bull. At any moment when this system grows, what we see is that the pie can quadruple and quintuple in a matter of months. And not just that, but we're going to see that happening again, you know. In terms of the global financial system, crypto is uh, an infinitesimal curiosity right now. 
And what, what it means to be successful is to deliver capabilities that empower and free people around the world who currently don't have opportunities and don't have choices. There's, that's billions of people, by the way. And you know, in that, from that perspective, I don't see these systems as competing. A lot of people are like, oh, no, Ethereum wins by beating Bitcoin or Bitcoin wins if only everybody abandons all the other altcoins and we get a maximalist position. To me, that's bull. There will always be a plethora of different options and opinions as to how to proceed. These will coexist. Not all of them will be viable. Not all of them will be interesting. Not all of them will be financially successful, but they'll still exist. Uh, and, that, and that's not because I want it to be so or because I'm guiding it in that direction. I'm simply calling it, right? That's how it's going to be. Mm. And, and, and I think the evidence over the last, I started saying that, I started talking about a multi-currency f- future where we have hundreds of thousands of different platforms, tokens, currencies, reward points, and things like that. I, I called that in 2013, um, before the, the concept of maximalism even existed. And and if anything, the evidence is more clear now than it was then. I think this is you know one of the reasons people really respect you because you you almost have this uh, elder statesman approach to explaining Bitcoin. You're just you know, you're like chill about it. It's not this us versus them type thing. You don't you're not prone to hysteria, you know, about anything that's going on in, in the Bitcoin news, which uh, is is stable. You're kind of like the stable coin of the Bitcoin world, Andreas. <laughs> what, what do you think about stable coins? Let's talk about those a little bit, you know, because now there's competition in the stable coin space. Do you think that uh, it's going to help or hurt the crypto ecosystem? I don't think stable coins are really related to the crypto ecosystem. I, I think what 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 stable coins represent is digital tokens um, representing digitalized fiat um, or tokenized fiat, but they're not cryptocurrencies. And there's a fundamental difference between a cryptocurrency and a stable coin. First of all, in a cryptocurrency, it's a native asset which is issued and not backed by anything. It exists on its own, right? Um, a, a stable coin by comparison is simply a certificate of ownership vis-a-vis or a token that represents some kind of reserve. Uh, depending on how that reserve is held and where it's held, that introduces significant counterparty risk. The whole point of decentralized, open, borderless, neutral, censorship-resistant cryptocurrencies is we take out counterparty risk. We reduce it massively. And we also maintain these principles of decentralization, open, borderless, neutral, censorship resistant, right? So what are stable coins? Are they open? No. Are they borderless? No. Are they censorship resistant? No. And are they neutral? No. Okay. Well, so what are they? They're a slightly better version of fiat, but they're a slightly worse version of crypto. And as long as you put them in that category and understand what they are, they're very useful because fiat sucks. And so stable coins are fiat that sucks less. That's that's my slogan. Stable coin. <laughs> the that's fiat great. that sucks less. <laughs> that, that's basically it. It's not crypto. It certainly sucks a lot if you compare it to crypto. But it sucks less than fiat because you can move it faster across borders. The problem is, and, and this is key, stable coins have greater counterparty risk than fiat. That's great. Because if I have a bank account with a billion US dollars in it that I've issued a billion tokens of some kind against it, and that bank account is frozen and seized, that Mm. stablecoin's toast, right? And all it takes is one person who has access to the stablecoin system to cause a problem by transmitting it across the wrong border, which is why it's not borderless, not being vetted properly, which is why it's not open. Uh, being one of the identified bad people, which is why it's not neutral, or ha- being able to sneak in a transaction to a potentially bad person, which is why it's not censorship resistant. All of those characteristics immediately will bring the attention of authorities. And they can't touch the token, but they can certainly touch the bank account, and they will touch that bank account. Hey, little bank account, show me on the doll. Where did the banker touch you? Well, that's not creepy at all. <laughs> right here, right here. That is a little creepy. Um, so, so let me ask this then. So, since there's a lot of different blockchains now, right? There's multiple. We saw so many being developed last year. 
Do you, do you foresee a time where they become more, there's more cross blockchain compatibility that way that the technologies talk to one another a little more effectively with within stable coins? You mean? No, within, within all the various different blockchains that are out there. It's not, no, no more, oh, yeah, no, more no more stable coins. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I think, I think what we're going to see is gradually we'll see uh, interoperability and protocols between cryptocurrencies that are already exist, but they're being rapidly developed. So you have side chains and you have atomic swaps mm -hmm. and you have um, submarine swaps with lightning and, and multi-currency state channels with lightning and, and, and the other ones. Uh, Raiden and Plasma and others who might might be multi-currency in the future could be multi-currency and and decentralized exchanges in, in all of their different ways. Now, if you take it to the point where the switching cost between two different cryptocurrencies is as low as possible, it becomes almost frictionless, where you can swap one cryptocurrency for another for nearly zero fee, um, preferably off-chain, without a transaction fee, and nearly instantaneously, so sub millisecond or a few milliseconds, um, then the concept of committing to a cryptocurrency is as ridiculous as the concept of committing to a specific router on the internet. So what you're going to do is you're going to have, obviously, cryptocurrencies that serve a purpose better. Like, I think we will see at least one cryptocurrency that is a store value cryptocurrency, right? And if you want to store value long-term, that's one of the ones you use. Maybe you'll have a portfolio. Maybe some of these will be commodity-backed stable coins, like a, a gold stable coin with a gold reserve. One of these is probably going to be Bitcoin. Uh, I think it's a very strong contender for that. And then you'll have others that are suitable for other things. Uh, maybe some of the store value stable coins are also useful as medium of exchange. That's great. And they will develop, they might develop great uh, velocity to do that. Um, but maybe you'll also have others. Uh, some uh, blockchains and cryptocurrencies are going to be better for running dApps and for doing smart contracts. And some are going to be better for storing data. Um, some are going to be better for uh, doing uh, resource sharing in terms of computing and wireless bandwidth and things like that. I think we're going to see things that emerge that are going to be focused on reputation. Um, and because of the different characteristics these things have, we're not going to have, I strongly believe that we're not going to have one system to rule them all. And the reason is very simple. The reason is that in everything we do here, there are real engineering trade-offs. And a trade-off fundamentally means in order to get more of X, I will have to get less of Y. Now, the naive marketeer and Schiller will say, oh no, our new coin can do maximally X and maximally Y at the same time. It's not true. Or there's a hidden dependency or other trade-off that you're not hearing. The, the thing that makes something a very, very good, robust, secure store of money, store of value, sound money, makes it crap for smart contracts and vice versa. So you can't do both. And so you have to choose. What are you going to be? You know, I, I use a metaphor where I say, you know, think of a vehicle, right? Do you want to be a Formula One car or do you want to be an agricultural tractor? And, and to say which one's better doesn't make any sense unless you first tell me what kind of application you want to do. If I want to haul six tons of hay bales through a muddy field, I'm not using a Formula One car. And if I want to go around uh, a circuit that only has left turns, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to use an agricultural tractor. Um, it, it's really simple as that. There always are trade-offs, which means nothing can do everything. And then the question becomes, if we have the ability to frictionlessly move from one to the other, then the world is a very different place. We don't have to have just one. We can just let our wallet figure out what it needs to be. I think you unwittingly came point. up with a new uh, sports uh, sports car sport, Formula One hay bale pulling, right? <laughs> right with the monster monster oh, cars. Trust me, I did. Trust me, I did not come up with that. Well, um, <laughs> if, you, if you visit any part of the of the rural South or even the Midwest in the U.S. 
Uh, tractor pulling is a yeah. very popular sport. That's true. And you will find arenas where they do that all the time. And some of the beasts That's they build. That's pretty funny. Well, speaking of unique. beasts being built, there's you know a lot of hype around what the Lightning Network would do for Bitcoin. And so now looking back at, at what's happened, do you feel like the implementation has been solid? Is it as big of a deal as many were saying it would be? And, and where do we go from here? So I, I've been constantly amazed by the Lightning Network, and the more I pay attention to it, the more excited I get about the future. Um, I think it's a bigger deal than most people realize. I think it's a bigger deal than what's being sold. I think its implications are go much deeper than most people realize. Um, and it, it's already moving faster than I expected. The innovation and research is moving faster than I expected. Even the implementation is moving faster than I expected. You know, there's so many fascinating things happening there. I've talked about some of the concepts, like kind of long-term vision for this. One of the concepts I've talked about is uh, called streaming money, which is uh, a qualitative change to the way we conceive of money and the final and full realization of the true meaning of the word cash flow is when you start doing sub millisecond payments at sub penny values um, as fast as possible, machine to machine payments that are uh, sub millisecond, sub penny, perhaps a thousandth of a penny uh, or less, nano payments, not micro payments. And you do them so fast that they effectively change from being a batch concept to being a flow, right? So it's like the transition of, of light from particles to waves, right? Money goes from being a particle where it comes in discrete chunks to being a flow where it flows continuously. And you start thinking of cash flow. You know, that, start, that is now uh, something that I can glimpse on the horizon as something that lightning can make happen. And it changes everything. That's the kind of application that allows us to build various user applications that we can't even imagine today and that can create adoption where the traditional financial system simply can't do it. So right now, so far in the cryptocurrency space, a lot of what we're doing is how about we do what we did in finance traditionally only with blockchain, right? We're doing money only now. It's new money, right? We're doing bank accounts. Only now they're new bank accounts. We're doing loans, but they're new loans. We're doing uh, VC money. Only it's a new style with ICOs, whatever. It's mostly reinventing the existing thing in a new format. What really excites me, however, is when we start building applications that simply cannot exist in the previous paradigm. When the internet goes from the obvious applications like Let's do some telephony. Let's replace fax machines. Let's do the postal service only now faster. Uh, and then it switches to let's do things we've never done before, like Twitter and social media and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, interactive storytelling, you know, all of that. That's when it really gets interesting. When the old technology can't even approach these applications. So lightning takes us down that path. It takes us to a whole different scale of time and value that we've never explored with traditional finance because it was impossible. We've never even explored it with traditional cash because it was impossible. It's exciting stuff. I, I love listening to you chat. It's almost like you're chatting, you're telling us a story, and then I, then I forget that we're actually interviewing you. I'm just like, I'm just listening to you. I'm like, oh, yeah, we gotta, we got to ask him a question here again. <laughs> well, I want to ask you. So one of one of the uh, one of our members in our mastermind, Britt Torberg uh, Gotland, she is actually part of the online course that you're offering by the by the University of Nicosia in Cyprus. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, she says she's like, wow. She's like, uh, she's so grateful that you're teaching them. But she's she's curious. Why did you choose to teach these newbies at six o'clock on Friday nights for so many weeks a year? Um, because, because my mission is education. That's, that's been my goal from the very beginning. It's what I'm good at. It's what I want to be doing. And what I want to do is get information, quality information, quality education 
that explains this technology in simple to understand terms in an unbiased way to as many people as possible in as many languages and countries as possible. So in order to do that, the crux of my strategy is open Creative Commons licenses, where I provide information that is free to everyone in as many languages as possible. Everything I produce is available for free in more than one formats and more than one languages. And the MOOC is part of that. You know, um, I had offers to do webinars for commercial companies and teach uh, VIPs and executives and MBAs and uh, senior business people and all of that crap. Um, where they they would pay you know three three hundred and ninety nine dollars for a one day seminar et cetera and I'm not interested in doing that. Um, the MOOC is open. It it can have thousands and thousands of participants. All of the videos are produced under Creative Commons. They're shared with the public. You can watch them even if you're not part of the MOOC. The MOOC itself is free, and it's it's being organized by uh, a university that uh, was early. Uh, they started this in 2013. They were the first to offer this. They were the first to do a master's degree. They were the first to put the academic certificates on the blockchain. And they share my values. They want to do this in a way that makes it available to as many people as possible. They share my open source ethos. And uh, they've done a really good job. So I continue to do it. This is now the 11th iteration of this MOOC. We've done 11 mm. semesters of it over the past five years that's super generous of you really mm -hmm. really really nice it let me clarify something because this is important um i get as much value from the mooc as i give to everybody when i'm doing the mooc what the mooc allows me to do is two things one it it allows me to get questions from a broad range of audiences across the world with different interests different applications different cultural biases, different perspectives, different needs. What that does is it keeps me grounded, right? If, I, if all I ever talk to is VCs about how to build their next ICO, or if I, all I ever talk to is computer scientists or whatever, I, I will start losing touch with what's happening in this community. So the, the work I do with community meetups with um, open Q&A and with the, the YouTube channel and with the MOOC is all about getting, basically getting the pulse of the community, being able to figure out what people are interested in, what questions they're asking, what things need to be explained better, which answers are working and which answers are not working, and to continuously refine how I answer a question, how I explain the concept. And that is not only my job, but it also allows me to not have a job. I mean, I am truly blessed in that I operate in this space and I cannot have a day job. Instead, I have this vocation that I love where I get to do exactly what I love without any strings attached. And I only get to do that because of the people who help me. And that's a very large community of people. And the people who participate in the MOOC are part of it, right? They teach me as much as I teach them. So it, it's not all altruistic here. I get a I get a wonderful result in this deal. Well, appreciate the humility, and it's real. It's definitely I can sense it's it's not false, and and everybody appreciates what you're well, doing. And before so, you get to the flip side, let's say this. Um, so a MOOC is a massive open online course. These are free courses, folks. And so if you're interested in checking out uh, Andreas's course, uh, we have the link in the uh, we have link in the description. Digitalcurrency.unic.ac.cy is where you can go to sign up. Yeah, we're currently in session. We're currently in session three of the MOOC. Uh, if you register at this point, it's going to be a bit late, but you can always do it twice. And we we do it three times a year. So the next session is going to be in the early summer. And then, uh, and then the next one is in the fall season. You're mooktastic. That's fantastic. So here, here's my question because I, I sense that you didn't um, reference too fondly to corporations, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are about people huddling around this idea of ETFs being necessary for Bitcoin to move forward and, and all this money that is apparently sitting on the sidelines and banks building blockchains. And are we running the risk of ruining the whole damn thing no. by trying to institutionalize it? 
I mean, if you try to institutionalize it, you know, you stare too long into the abyss and the abyss stares back, right? Um, the, the problem with institutionalizing it is that you expose this technology to people who have the intention and the means to try to co-opt as much as possible of the messaging, and they will then fund marketing campaigns to present it as something else. And we've seen this happen consistently, right? They hijacked the term blockchain and turned it into this uh, permission, permissioned, uh, private, controlled, centralized, ridiculous concept um, that they're trying to sell to investors that strips away all of the interesting aspects of open decentralized uh, blockchain technology and, and, and turns it into you know, a pet for 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 corporate centralized business as usual so this is a classic strategy and you see it with a lot of disruptive technologies which is you know fud on the one side fear uncertainty and doubt and then on the other side embrace extend extinguish which used to be microsoft's pr uh, preferred uh, mechanism for dealing with competition from um, disruptive technologies they tried to do embrace extend extinguish to the internet you know, pull it in, shut it down, turn it centralized, try to control the standards bodies, um, uh, push the standard in a direction that gives you more and more control, and try to isolate your users from the open side and keep them in a walled garden. It failed and backfired, actually damaged Microsoft's standing uh, tremendously because what people wanted was the open network. It's going to fail again with the institu institutionalization of uh, exchange traded funds and all of the other uh, bank related things that are going to try and take this and turn it into a not decentralized but fully centralized alternative. Um, it's going to fail not because they're not going to be able to raise money or make coins that have more market cap. Of course, they're going to do that, right? If, if JP Morgan Chase launches Chase Coin tomorrow, it would have a greater market cap than all of Bitcoin. Mm. Um, and if Facecoin did it, um, if Facebook did Facecoin, um, they would be able to get more users and they'd get a higher market capitalization. Money can produce money, right? So if what you have is, is, is uh, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars um, sitting in bank accounts, a 0% interest rate that you can throw at problems, you can create the appearance of success. You're not giving people power. You're not giving them freedom. You're not giving them alternatives. You're not giving them choices. You're giving them the same old packaged up deal wrapped in some slick marketing and trying to co-opt the name of open decentralized cryptocurrencies. They can't break Bitcoin with this. All they can do is tarnish its image when they lose their keys and lose money or get hacked. And eventually people will figure out that with an ETF, you're a second-class participant or even third-class participant in cryptocurrencies, right? You're twice removed from any of the decisions of consensus or in the participation in the network or in the economic activity. And you're not peer-to-peer. -peer. You're peer-to-corporations, corporations, corporation-to-peer. Uh, and if you wanted to exist in that world, well, I have a product for you. It's called Visa. Um, you could also use PayPal. They already exist. You could use Venmo. What's the point of doing cryptocurrency? So, again, we're going to see this happen, but it's not going to be effective. Because the one thing they can't do is produce creativity, right? If massive multinational corporations with hundreds of thousands of employees could produce creativity, then disruptive technology would be coming from them. It never does. And the reason it never does is because no matter how much money you have in the world, you can never buy the passion and creativity of the people who love what they do. Uh, the cryptocurrency space has been built by people who love what they do and they don't do it for the money. And you can't buy that passion and creativity. I'm thinking of doing a talk where all I show in the slides behind me is fan art, mashups, and videos that people have done mashing up my words with dubstep and the soundtrack from Aladdin and <laughs> Beyonce, God knows what else. I have a whole collection of that. And, and just put that up on a slide deck at a banker's conference and say, you know what? You can never buy this, and this is why we will win. I, I really enjoy that approach because I like to win, and I want the crypto space 
mm-hmm. to win because, like you said, fiat sucks. That is true. Well, define winning. That's the first step, right? And, and when you define winning a specific way, so the the greatest the greatest lie the banking devil ever told you was that winning is market cap, right? That's the great illusion. Because if you buy into the idea that success in cryptocurrency is whoever has the most amount of money, well, guess who has the most amount of money? Banks! (laughs) Oh my God, it's almost as if that was intentional. What a great piece of propaganda. Mm -hmm. Listen, kids, the way we will measure your success is by the thing we have the most of. (laughs) Genius. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. If you define that, then of course, you know, Facecoin wins, right? And you, you see that all the time. You know, the, the best way to do that is to make the most the most obsequious, um, sold out, shilly, centralized, crappy government regulated coin and pump billions of dollars of fiat debt into it. And of course, it's going to win on that metric. And they're going to do that. So let's define winning. What does winning mean? Winning means preserving our little corner of the internet and keeping it free. Winning means creating an economy where freedom and choice and empowerment of individuals are possible, even if that's not the biggest economy, as long as it exists and gives people an alternative choice. Freedom doesn't mean we build the biggest system that wins all of the economic activity. Uh, winning means we build a system that continues to give freedom and choice to people. And on that perspective, Bitcoin is winning more today than it was in December of last year. Mm. Right? Uh, Because in December of last year, when it was hitting $20,000, it was winning in market cap, but it was actually getting less free and less open and more surveilled and more custodial account driven. Right. And huge fees, too. Good Lord, the fees were high and it was so slow. Yes. Well, because it was actively under attack by people who wanted to scare you into changing the, the system. Mm-hmm. Embrace, extend, extinguish. Right now, fortunately, they, they, they got to the they got past the embrace and they got to the extend. And when they got to the extend and said, hey, we're just going to change the specs here a tiny bit. Everybody went, uh, no. Hey, let me ask you this, and we're, we, as, we, as we wrap this thing up, we have another couple of questions which kind of seem similar from some members of our uh, mastermind. Uh, John wants to know what's your next book going to be, and then also Paulo wants to know what projects are you currently working on? My next book is currently in negotiation. I have not uh, finalized that. And it will be announced at some point, probably towards Q2 of this year. Is it going to be called Coins and How to Love Them? Mastering not- Coins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not that exact title. <laughs> yeah. I think Mastering Coins was already taken, actually. Nice. Um, so, yes. Um, and it, 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 I, I think also the, the bull animal was taken from the safari uh from the safari series on o'reilly so i couldn't use that as a cover um yeah i'm not going to announce it yet sometime in q2 uh once i've decided what i'm doing and i've got a a a solid basis then i'm going to um start on the next thing probably won't do any writing until um the end of the year Uh, i don't want to get into another book so soon after finishing the previous one um i'm working on a bunch of other projects uh we're going to be doing some big stuff in 2019. Uh, In the last two years, uh, thanks to the support of uh, Patreon, in fact, and all of the people who support me with a monthly subscription there, I've been able to expand my team from uh, two part-time people to a total of nine staff, uh, of whom three are full-time. And that's given me uh, a lot more uh, leverage and scale to do things. Uh, so that I can focus on the things that I'm good at, um, for example, content, and uh, let other people do the things I suck at, for example, scheduling and <laughs> organization and detail and anything like that. Um, Travis sucks and, at those too, by the way. He he sucks yeah. really bad at those. 
it, it's okay. It's okay to suck at things as long as you understand what you are good at mm -hmm. and what you suck at, and then mm -hmm. find other people um, to complement your own skills. And I, I've been able to build a really amazing team of incredible professionals. And um, with that team, and because of the monthly subscriptions, we've been able to expand Spanish language offerings, expand the types of offerings and the activities we do, do more events, do more community events, travel more, go to more places, produce more books. Uh, and we're going to just turn it up even more in 2019. These go to 11. Yes, they yeah, do. Perfect. Andreas Antonopoulos, delivered, over-delivered. And I hope you'll come back and, uh, and visit with us again in the future. The uh, the website, antonopoulos.com, in the show notes, badco.in forward slash 244 for all the links. Thanks again, Andreas. Thank you so much, Joel. Thank you. I don't know about you, Travis, but I don't even smoke cigarettes, but that was so good. I feel like I need a cigarette right now. You know, actually, it was it was – it was amazing. I, I think we should uh, transcribe this one and turn this into, you know, a downloadable thing or have the whole transcription be available on the, the show notes or something, uh, because, I mean, he, he just dropped so many nuggets. And that's basically what he does, man. Like we saw him at East Denver. He went up on stage for like 45 minutes. No slides. He just went and talked about the unstoppable code of of blockchain and just off the cuff, unbelievable, very eloquent, very succinct. You know, I, I really enjoyed it. And then afterwards, he, you know, his name is Andreas M. Antonopoulos. His initials are AMA. And so after his after his uh, uh, presentation, he basically said, OK, now ask me anything. And then uh, there was a bunch of people in line and. Wow, he answered questions like all night. It was crazy. Um, he reminds me. He reminds me of like he's like the like in a way. He, he reminds me of how Gary V does his presentations. He'll do his presentations. He'll he'll go he'll go off the cuff, and then he'll just anybody can ask answer ask questions to him after the after his presentation, right? So in that regard, very similar. Uh, Andreas is not as as boisterous or as loud, but oh my god, Andreas is one of the great thinkers of our time and certainly one of the great thinkers in this space. Yeah. He totally freestyled that whole presentation and the Q and a he's like, he's like the rapper of the crypto world without rhymes. I mean, he, he just drops it like it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> that was like a girly little giggle. You did there. Well, I was taking a drink at the same time. So I didn't want to spew all over my microphone. <laughs> I know, but it was it was sweet, Mr. Travis. Oh. Right? You were like, <laughs> Andreas. <laughs> yeah, as I dribble Coca-Cola down my cheek. Hey, make sure you pass this episode on to uh, some friends. I think that this would be a great introduction for a lot of people because he does, even though he talks highly technical, he is kind of like crypto for every person, right? He just makes it simple to understand. Well, that's his uh, mission. His mission is to help the newbies understand the cryptos. And what was great was I think Mr. Joel Com had to had to bail whenever we had a conversation with him and then he had to go do another interview or another something he had another meeting or something. So I got to chat with him for like another 15 minutes afterwards. It was just him and I and it was just phenomenal. The dude, his mission is clearly to help mass adoption, to help the noobs understand the cryptos, you know. Make sure to go check out the the university the University of Nicosia, N-I-C-O-S-I-A, and it is their blockchain initiative. Uh, if you basically just type in that, University of Nicosia, and then um, Andreas Antonopoulos, I'm sure you'll be able to find that. And they're going to be having another uh, course, I guess, be beginning in maybe a month and a half or so. So they're already in the middle of one. And they're going to have another one here coming up shortly. So if you want to learn about crypto and, and listen to Andreas for 13 weeks in a row and gain your knowledge in the blockchain space, that might not be a bad idea. And oh, by the way, it's um, it's free. It doesn't, doesn't cost you anything. Free education, Mr. Jokom. Education is good. And we appreciate you guys. Thanks for always being bad. And we'll catch you on the next episode. Got some great stuff coming your way. And until then, stay bad. Who's bad?
The Bad Crypto Podcast is a production of Bad Crypto LLC. The content of the show, the videos, and the website is provided for educational, informational, and entertainment purposes only. It's not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investment, or trading advice of any kind. You shouldn't make any decisions as to finances, investing, trading, or anything else based on this information without undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional financial advisor. Please understand that the trading of Bitcoin's and alternative cryptocurrencies have potential risks involved. Anyone wishing to invest in any of the currencies or tokens mentioned on this podcast should first seek their own independent professional financial advisor. What does your morning sound like? (laughs) That's Daddy's little man. Morning, Daddy. Grab your usual from Mickey D's. Here's to making your morning routine a little better with a delicious breakfast from McDonald's. Start your day at McDonald's with a refreshingly bold large McCafe iced coffee for just $2. Price and participation may vary for a limited time. Cannot be combined with any other offer or any combo meal.